In this video, we're going to investigate some other properties of electromagnetic waves. Specifically, we're going to encounter the fact that electromagnetic waves don't always behave as waves. In fact, sometimes they behave like particles. And in this video, we're going to address the learning objectives, which are being able to convert between energy, wavelength, and frequency for light, and also to define quantization. So first of all, we're going to look at a classic experiment, which is the photoelectric effect. The photoelectric effect is illustrated from a classic experiment where light of a specific frequency is shined onto a metal and electrons are emitted from that metal. This means that the light is transferring energy to the metal and causing the electron to be emitted. Classical theory should predict that more electrons will be ejected if the wavelength is shortened or the intensity brightened, both of which should increase the total energy of the wave. We're actually going to take a look at this experiment through a simulation. So this is a simulation of the photoelectric effect. And at right now, it's not on. There's no light. The intensity is set to zero. So nothing's happening. If I go ahead and increase the intensity, I will turn on the light and we can see that electrons are ejected from the metal based on the interaction of the light. If I increase the intensity, I should expect to see more of the electrons emitted. And I can go ahead and increase the frequency of the light, which increases its energy. And that, again, causes the electrons to come off now with some more kinetic energy. And I can actually plot this if I increase the light. However, if I decrease the frequency of the light, at some point, it's going to be too low to eject any electrons. So classically, if you shine light on the metal, increasing the intensity should increase the amount of energy available. And at some point, those electrons should have absorbed enough energy to be emitted, but that never happens. Instead, I have to actually change the frequency before I can see any electrons ejected. At some point, there's a threshold where the electrons are just barely leaving the metal. I'm not going to take the time to, to really find that right now, but this simulation is freely available and you're welcome to explore where that actual cutoff is. But what I want you to see from this is that changing the frequency of the light affects whether or not electrons are emitted, and it also affects how much kinetic energy those electrons have coming out. And then below the, the threshold for the metal, which is sometimes called the work function, nothing happens. And it doesn't matter if my intensity is turned up as much as it can be, we're never going to see any electrons coming off. So what's happening in this simulation is that light is being delivered to the metal in chunks. It's not being delivered as a continuous stream of energy. If it was a continuous stream, increasing the intensity should eventually add enough energy to the system that those electrons would be emitted. But as I mentioned, that's not the case, which means the light, the light that is being absorbed by the metal is being absorbed in chunks. And those chunks we call photons for light. And more generally, they're quanta. It's a certain set amount of energy that is transferred. And it turns out that the energy of the photon of light depends only on its frequency. There's no dependence on the intensity or the amplitude of the light. The only dependence is on the frequency. And we could also change that frequency into a wavelength because as we discussed in the previous video, the frequency and wavelength are inversely related through the speed of light as the constant. It turns out that the relationship of energy to frequency is through a constant, which is Planck's constant. So this is given down at the bottom here. This is a constant you can look up in any table that includes physical constants because it appears in a lot of different areas of chemistry. So the key takeaway from this experiment is that waves actually behave like particles. They don't just behave like waves. They also have this particle-like behavior. The idea that only certain values are allowed is the idea of quantization. So certain properties, such as energies, there are some others as well, which we'll probably encounter at least briefly, that only occur in specific set amounts. 
So you can think of this as sort of the difference between a continuous function where you can have any value along the y-axis or a quantized function where it has to jump from value to value. And if your required jumps are small enough, it's going to appear basically continuous. So in some limit, quantization is no longer important to consider, and we can treat things with classical physics. But at the really small scale, such as we encounter in chemistry with atoms and molecules, this becomes a very important phenomenon. And understanding quantization is really fundamental to understanding atomic behavior and properties. Just to give you a better sense of what quantization really means, we can think about a couple of macroscopic examples. So the first one here is a faucet, which is dripping. In that case, only certain volumes are allowed. You're not going to see sort of a continuous amount of water if it's just drips. However, if you increase that flow, eventually it becomes continuous. So that's sort of showing that the transition between the quantized state where you have discrete drops to the classical state or the continuous state. Another illustration is the difference between a ramp and stairs. On a ramp, you can have any value of basically height above the ground, whereas on stairs, you're only going to be able to take them in discrete chunks. So before we wrap up this video, let's take a look at a practice calculation. And what we want to go ahead and do is apply this energy expression for the frequency and wavelength of light. At this point, I would recommend that you pause the video and try the calculations on your own before checking the solutions. Assuming you've taken a few minutes to work through this, let's go ahead and take a look at, at the results. So to calculate the energy of light with a wavelength of 4.7 times 10 to the negative eighth meters, I want to use the fact that the energy is equal to hc over lambda. h and c are both constants. h is 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34th joules, which is a unit of energy, times seconds. C is the speed of light, which is 3.0 times 10 to the eighth meters per second. It's a speed or a velocity. And the wavelength is given as 4.7 times 10 to the negative eighth meters. If I plug this into my calculator, I end up with 4.23 or 4.22 which I'm going to round to two significant figures as 4.2 times 10 to the minus 18. And the units that I have here are joules because everything else in this expression should cancel. So the seconds cancel, the meters on top and bottom will cancel. And again, all I'm left with is the joules. Uh, so the frequency of the light, I can relate to the energy or I could relate back to the wavelength because we also saw in the last video that the wavelength and the frequency are related through the speed of light. But since I just calculated the energy, I'm gonna go ahead and use that. So I have the energy is equal to H times the frequency, or the frequency is just the energy divided by H. And so if I go ahead and plug in my numbers, I have 4.2 times 10 to the minus 18 as the energy. And Planck's constant is again 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 joules times seconds. So my units here will be in inverse seconds or one over seconds, which was the frequency that we used. So if I again plug this into my calculator, I end up getting that this is 6.38, which rounds to 6.4 times 10 to the 15th one over seconds or this is going to be the same as inverse seconds or hertz. The final question asks which region of the electromagnetic spectrum this light is going to belong to. In order to answer this question, I would need to look at a table that correlates the frequency or energy um, with the type of light on the electromagnetic spectrum. 10 to the minus 8 meters, 10 to the 15 hertz, as the frequency and 10 to the negative 18 as the joules all lead me to the ultraviolet region of the spectrum. So now whichever quantity I look at, whether that's the wavelength, the energy, or the frequency should lead me to the ultraviolet region of the spectrum. And one thing that could be helpful 
as far as keeping track of where you are in the spectrum is to learn the region for visible light, which is typically from about 400 to 750 nanometers. And so if the wavelength is shorter than that, it should be higher energy than visible light. If it's longer, it should be lower energy. And so here with 4.7 times 10 to the negative eight meters, there are 10 to the nine nanometers in one meter. And so I should end up with this light being about 47 nanometers, which is smaller than the range of the visible light. So we would expect it to be higher energy than the visible light. That's all for this video. I hope you learned something about calculating the energy of electromagnetic radiation and also about quantization. Take a few minutes and think about what other macroscopic examples of quantization you might encounter in your daily life. And also do some practice problems on converting between frequency, wavelength, and energy. See you soon.